into another month. There are more days passed in 2021 than there are in front of us. 2021 is more than halfway over. And it seemed like just yesterday we were renovating this building. So time keeps on ticking. But thanks be to God, we have a Savior who is still with us. Amen. Through, the, through it all. Through the ups, through the downs, he is with us. In this pandemic, he is still with us. Amen. Amen. Glory be to God. We're so thankful for who he is in our lives. Amen. Amen. We give him glory this morning. We give him praise this morning. Amen. Amen. I keep thinking about time and how fast it's gone and, and how things change with time. But the Lord said that he is God and he changes not. And amen. Aren't you glad we have a God that don't change? Amen. 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 We serve a God that does not change. That means if he was a healer back then, he's a healer today. He was a keeper back then, he's a keeper today. Amen. He's a deliverer back then. He's still delivering us today. Amen. So we glorify him this morning. We greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Glad to have with us, amen, uh, our first revival speaker this morning, uh, Minister Mark Quentin Holland, who is the head basketball coach at Winterboro High School. Amen. I know he's here because I see his wife and I see his auntie. Amen. Amen. So we're looking forward to the word this morning. We greet you all who may be in the parking lot that's listening on 87.9. Thank God for you being here this morning. I'm going to be brief and do a Sunday school review, but this comes from a scripture that's very near and dear to my heart. From day one, Romans 10 has been near and dear to my heart. Amen. Amen. And today, our text takes us to Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 17. And the lesson topic is seeking confidence. Seeking confidence. And when you think about or when I think about the word confidence, I think about stability of mind. If you're confident, you're not shaky in your understanding. You're not shaky in your belief. You're not shaky in your doing. You're not shaky in your thinking. Amen. And, and with knowledge comes confidence. Amen. When, when I first started preaching, I was up here and, and some of you might have recognized my hand was shaking like a leaf. And I kept laughing during the sermon just to keep myself in the sermon. I was very nervous. But that's because I, was, I had no confidence in me. But I shouldn't have had confidence in me. I should have put my confidence in the God who called me. And I didn't understand that early on in the ministry. As, as the years went by, and thanks be to God, this is 10 years later today. Thanks be to God. 
God, I realize that my confidence still must be in God. I may not be shaking when I preach, but I'm not shaking because I'm confident in me. I'm shaking because I know about him. Amen. Amen. So in your knowledge of God comes a godly confidence. Yeah. And the reason why I dis, the, discern, uh, the reason why I, I make a discernment of godly confidence is because there's a confidence in yourself that is ungodly and unhealthy. Uh -huh. And these are the type of people who Paul deals with in the beginning of Romans chapter number 10. Yes, he starts Romans chapter number 10 saying, brethren and, and sisters, I wish of all things that Israel might be saved. But the problem, the reason why they're not saved is because they go on to establish their own form of righteousness, which is not after knowledge. So in other words, what Paul is saying is that their confidence in their ability to keep the law is what they think their salvation is but they have not put their confidence in Jesus. And the problem is that their confidence in keeping of the law was flawed and it was limited by their understanding of the law. And Jesus poked holes in the Pharisees' understanding of the law because every time they tried to challenge him with the law and challenge him and show, them that, show Jesus that they knew the law, Jesus would show them that they really don't know the law. For example, for, for, for example, when he told the man with the withered hand to stretch forth your hand, it was the Sabbath. But Jesus didn't have to do any work to get him to do it. The man didn't have to stretch forth. I mean, he didn't have to work to stretch forth his hand. All he did was an act of faith and obedience that wasn't work, and it made the Pharisees mad. And Jesus says to these Pharisees, which one of you would have a donkey that would fall into a well, wouldn't try to rescue your donkey when he fall into the well, even if it was a Sabbath? Would you leave him down there whining, or would you get him out? So Jesus poked holes in the understanding of the law. They didn't realize who Jesus is. If they truly understood the law, they would understand that Moses and talked about Jesus. They would understand that everything Jesus had done when he was on the earth was fulfilling everything that was prophesied before they had gotten there. So they were going to establish their own form of righteousness. So their confidence was in the flesh. Their confidence was in their own ability to keep the law. And you can't do it because the Bible says that if you offend the law in one point, you offend the whole law. And then their system of worship, their temple worship, their giving of sacrifices was not according to Old Testament, uh, uh, according to the Old Testament practices. They no longer had the Ark of the Covenant. They no longer had a high priest after the order of Levi. So they were not able to keep the law like God established it in the first place. But they were still confident in self. Let me tell you that there, there, there's a couple of things that happens when you're confident in yourself. If you're overconfident in yourself, number one, you'll think too highly of yourself. This was the Pharisees' problem. They thought too highly of themselves, so they looked down on people who weren't on their level. The second thing is that you won't seek anybody's help. This is the reason why they couldn't seek help from a Messiah. Because they were confident in themselves. They acted like they didn't need any help from anybody else. So they were establishing their own form of righteousness. But Paul begins our first outline by telling us that Moses described the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. This is where their confidence was. But our confidence must be in this, verse 6, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith this righteousness which is of faith? That the word is already close to you. It's even in thy mouth and in thy heart that is the word of faith which he, we preach. In other words, the, the righteousness which is of the faith does not say we still waiting for a Messiah. The righteousness is of the faith say that Jesus already came to this earth and he is our Messiah. He lived a perfect life and he died on the cross for our sin. But early on the third day, he got up with all power in his hands that's the righteousness of the faith people in Israel still to this day are looking for a Messiah when the Messiah clearly came almost 2,000 years ago 
But those of us who would be righteous today must put our faith in Jesus Christ. Because your righteousness is as filthy rags and your ability to keep the law, you will find that it is, you have a futile attempt. You will not be able to keep the law on your own. So we put on the righteousness of Christ by believing on Christ. We put on his perfection. We put on his spirit, his character, his righteousness. Amen. Secondly, in our second outline, we, we, we have faith in Jesus Christ. He says this, that if you confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We ain't got time to deal with that in too, too much detail, but we got to understand. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus means that you confess he is Lord. You put yourself at his mercy. It's not just saying you believe in Jesus, but it is placing yourself at his hand, at his feet. It is laying your life before him and allowing him to be Lord over your life. You will allow his spirit to guide you, to speak to you, to direct you, to empower you. Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. I don't tell you what to do, but I look to you from direction. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. Then he tells us why you shall be saved. With the heart man believes unto righteousness. I told you when you believe in the risen Jesus that you put on his righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made to salvation. I want you to know that he didn't put no other steps in that. No other steps. He didn't say, whosoever shall speak in tongues shall be saved. Now, now, while speaking in tongues is a real thing, the scripture don't say speaking in tongues is a requirement to be saved. He says that if thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, I wish we stopped changing the scripture and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead. This is a promise. Thou shall be saved. <laughs> And if you believe anything outside of that, you're going to establish your own form of righteousness. Don't you know that that is a trick from the enemy? The enemy wants you to get in yourself. The enemy wants you to have faith in yourself, confidence in your own abilities, in your own spiritual gifts, so that you'll believe you're saved because of what comes out of you. But we're saved because what we believe came out of Jesus. Lord, have mercy. We already got a preacher. <laughs> this is why faith is so important. So many people put such little importance on faith, but faith is all we got. Because we put all the chips in on Jesus. We put the whole bet on Jesus. We still got to live holy, but it is because of Jesus and Jesus alone that salvation has come to the center. Lord, have mercy. Scripture said, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And he tells us there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich upon them that call upon him. I wish these, these, these racist preachers and racist Christians today would read that scripture. We all in the same boat as sinners and we all in the same boat as saints. And it's all because of one man, the God man and his blood that all of us are brought close to Christ. Then he tells us that all the walls are torn down. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not just a mouth thing. It's a heart thing. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The temptation is for us to, to, to have a monopoly on this scripture. We want to say who can and who can't be saved. We want to say what community, what group, what color, what belief, what who can be saved. But whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're seeking confidence. You'll find confidence in Christ. 
Man will try to throw all things at you and, and, and try to shake your confidence in Christ. I try to point out who you are, who they think you are. Man will put on the title of accuser of the brethren. And when we do that, we side with Satan. All we throw is accusations at a person and say, who can and who can't be saved? And who is and who ain't saved? But whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then lastly, and I'm done, we got to find confidence in the preached word. You need a preacher. Everybody, everybody is a preacher, but everybody isn't a preacher. Everybody that's saved has a message to tell. But God still calls those who will stand before you and speak an on time word. God still has a chef in the kitchen. Uh, God still has, everybody can put together a microwave meal, but you still need a shelf. Lord have mercy. How shall they call on him whom they not believe? How shall they believe in him whom they not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? <laughs> but how should they preach except to be sent? There's a lot of preachers that ain't sent. <laughs> A lot of preachers that's just excited about preaching. And it's a lot of folk that got their little singing voice and got their little preachy voice and they think they called to preach just because you can hoop. Hooping don't make a preacher. I ain't never heard David, David Jeremiah hoop, but yet that man that taught me all kind of things about the word of God. We think just because we get a technique that we're a preacher, but how can you preach except you're sent? In other words, how can you preach the true gospel? How can you preach what God spoke? Unless God gave you the license to do it. Just because the preacher gave you the license don't mean God gave it. And then that last verse, we must remember verse 17. That faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. I told you in the beginning that I got confidence in God over the course of years. Because when I first started preaching, I had no confidence. And my, my, my confidence was in the wrong person. It was in me. And since I was shaking, my, my, my word was shaking. My hands were shaking. My voice was shaking. But the more I got to learn about who God is and studying his word, I can stand up here and not have, I, I, I might not have studied anything. If the preacher didn't show up, I could still stand up here and preach. Because I know who God is. My faith is increased. My faith is strengthened because I got to know him through his word. Thank you. We're going to ask the deacons to come for a short devotion. I just want to thank Pastor Jacob for giving us that review of Sunday school this morning. I hope everybody, I hope everybody take that key. Let's just, 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 just let go and let go. My think to turn a couple of First, let me say good morning to each of you. We thank and praise the Lord for allowing us to be in the house of worship one more time. Amen. For truly, it's a blessing to be here. You know, God is a good God, and he is worthy to be praised. And we ought to praise him while we have the chance. For we don't know what tomorrow may bring. This may be our last time. Our scripture for the morning will come from Psalms 90, beginning at the first verse, and it reads as thus. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight is but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with the flood. They are as, the, as sleep. In the morning they are like grass which grow up. In the morning it flourishes and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and wither it. For we are consumed by thine anger. And by thy wrath we are troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee. Our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in the wrath. 
We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score years. Yet is thou strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. We know the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear. So is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word for the edification of our souls. Let us bow our heads for a moment of prayer. This morning, O oh gracious God, we come right now in the mighty name of Jesus. O oh gracious God, we come with no shape, form, or fashion. But Lord, we just come to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for you've been mighty good to us. Lord, you brought us through dangers, seen and unseen. And we just want to glorify your name right now, Lord. Father, you watched over us last night while we slumbered and slept. And early this morning, Lord, you touched us with the finger of love. Then, Lord, you allowed us to come out to the house of worship one more time. And, Lord, we come right now just to give you honor, glory, and praise. For you are worthy of all praise and honor and glory that we can give you and more. Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we don't know what tomorrow may bring. But we know that you are in control of tomorrow and today. Father, so we ask you to have your way in this service right now, Lord. Lead God and direct our paths. Help us to step out of self and allow you to lead and guide and do the things that's pleasing in thy sight. But Lord, we realize that we need you right now. We are down here while men, women, boys, and girls are counting your name unholy. But Lord, you said the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. Lord, we just thank you that we have a God that sits high and looks low, who knows everything about us. Lord, we thank you for this day. We ask you to bless our pastor right now. Bless his family, Lord. Touch him right now, Lord. Bless the man that's going to bring that word, Father. Be with him, lead him, and guide him, and strengthen him, Lord. And Lord, when we too, like others, must die, we pray that thou would give us a home somewhere in thy kingdom, where we can praise thy name forever. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Come on, let the church say amen. amen. Come on, let us say amen again. Amen. Come on, now, let us say amen one more time. Amen. One for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the, the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen. Did you come to praise the Lord this morning? Did you come with praise on your lips? Did anybody come with praise on your lips this morning? Now, I double dog dare you to stand to your feet and let's give God some hope. We'll surely trim down now. Amen. We want to say good morning to you. Amen. I was glad when they said, let us come into the house of God one more time. Amen. I know we come on special business this morning. Amen. And I'm going to get out of the way as I said. Amen. We're going to let go and let God have his way up in here. Come on, Pastor. Amen. Good, good morning to all of you again. Amen. We're thankful for the opportunity to call in three young men who are near and dear to my heart this month. 
the Lord placed it on my heart just not to do a midweek revival this time, but we can just flow like we're flowing in Sunday morning service. And amen, I ain't got to be jealous of nobody, but I love them all. Amen. Got an opportunity to be fed, and I'm excited about being fed. Amen. Amen. Give honor and glory to God, our Heavenly Father. I do want to get greetings out of Wade, Reverend Marshall, my brother, Sister Marshall, to Reverend Thompson in his absence, Sister Thompson, to our guests for today. Amen. Minister Holland and his wife, to my wife, to our officers, trustees, to all of you. I'm so thankful to introduce this young man that's about to step up and bring the word under the power of God. He's like a little brother to me. We may not talk all the time, but I believe you know that I love him. Amen. To see him and his brother fight through obstacles and to be where they are today. Amen. Not many people can say that they have their story, uh, his story. But this young man... This young man became the head coach of the Winterboro High School basketball team. And amen. I'm so proud of him. Amen. Looking forward to good things coming out of Talladega County down there on Highway 21. Amen. Amen. But the first time I heard him preach, I heard the coach spirit come out of him. And amen. He wasn't up there trying to be like everybody else. He just did what God anointed him to do. And I know his, his wife is back there, amen, into that. He's very unique. He's very motivational. He's inspirational. And he's gifted and anointed. Amen. He was licensed and ordained in heaven first. And then I saw him be licensed and ordained over here at Keller Springs Missionary Baptist Church. And amen, I'm not going to say anything else. I just want you to know that there's an awesome man of God behind me who is on his way up to this pulpit. And I just ask you to lift your right hands and receive him with me. And say, Reverend Holland, preach the word. Reverend Holland, preach the word. Reverend Holland, let the Lord use you to preach to me. God bless you. Man, come on and give God a hand clap of praise. Come on, you can do better than that. Come on and give God a hand clap of praise. Come on, you can do better than that. Come on and give God a hand clap of praise. Okay, if that was for me, that would be okay. But I said give God a hand clap of praise. He woke you up this morning. He started you on your way. You looking better than you ever looked. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Surely God is worthy to be praised. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful to be here. Amen. With you. Amen. Amen. I want to give honor to God always who's there to my life. Amen. To your pastor. Amen. I love y'all, pastor. Amen. You have a great pastor. Come on, let's celebrate this man and God. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Amen. You have a great pastor. I'm almost afraid to preach after all that good preaching he did a while ago, amen. But I love this man, I've known him a long time since I was a little bitty boy, uh, amen. And he's just been an awesome, awesome man. He's an awesome mentor for me, amen. And I'm just thankful for him, his wife, his family, amen. Reverend Marshall, Sister Marshall, her family, taught the officers, deacons, members, visitors, friends, saints, sinners. All of you, my father's children, I greet you in the only name that matters. Amen. That's the name of Jesus. Amen. I definitely want to get one into my wife, baby. Just wave at me. Amen. So you start talking about me, you need to know where my wife at. Amen. Amen. Grab your Bibles. <laughs> Grab your Bibles. We're going to Acts, the second chapter. Amen. I see some familiar faces, so I feel right at home. Amen. I might be able to preach a little bit. Amen. 
I know y'all used to steaking potatoes over here with, with Jacobs. I just got some chips and salsa for you today. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Acts the second chapter. Acts the second chapter. Amen. We're going to go to the 42nd verse. Amen. Acts the second chapter and the 42nd verse. Amen. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Amen. Acts the second chapter and the 42nd verse. It reads like this. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Amen. That's all I need this morning. <laughs> Amen. Amen. If you if you'll say amen this morning, I'll be quick and powerful. If you don't say amen, I'll just be quick. Amen. I want to use what topic this morning, if you would allow me uh use this topic. It's called Back to the Basics. Back. To the basics. Amen. At age 45, Vince Lombardi became a head football coach in the NFL for the first time in his life. It was 1959 and he had the challenging task of leading the Green Bay Packers, a team that had only won two games the previous season. So Lombardi had his work cut out for him. But Lombardi wasn't going to let last year's record shape his expectations. This, after all, was a new season. And I really could sit down and go on home right there, uh, Pastor Jason, because that's preaching all by itself. He said, I won't let the things that happened last year affect what's going to happen in this next season of my life. I won't let things out of my control stop me from getting what I have planned in my future. All right, y'all like Bible over here. Let me give it to you like this. Philippians 3 and 13 said, Brother, and I count not myself how apprehended, but this one thing I would do, forgetting those things which are behind me, and I'm reaching forth unto the things which are before me. Hey, man, let me go. That ain't my assignment today. Let, 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 let me go. It says, when the, when the discouraged, discouraged group of players got for the first season, Sure, they wonder how their new coach was planning to turn things around. Right. Coach Lombardi entered the locker room and stood silently for a few seconds. Right. Holding out a football in front of these men, he spoke one of the most famous quotes yeah. in football history. Right. He said, gentlemen, right. this is just a football. Right. In just five words, the new coach had communicated his philosophy for the team's success. Right. They were going to start with the basics and make sure to execute the fundamentals. Yes, Watch this now. You see the Packers have been losing not because they lack talent. Right. Forgotten the basics. Right. I wish I had some help this morning. Right. And, and, and in case you didn't know, listen, I a little football myself. Uh-huh. And, and there are four keys to success if you if you want to have a successful season. All right. Amen. And the first thing, first key to success is alignment. Right. Alignment. Right. See, over my coaching career, I found that a lot of times when my team gives up big play, most of the time it's not that they didn't know what to do. It's that they were out of alignment. Y'all help me preach this morning. A lot of times we Christians find ourselves out of alignment. And suddenly we find ourselves taking hit after hit and we'll burn it down by things that were never intended for us. See, understanding football a little, you understand that everyone has a responsibility. And when you're not in the line, you make it hard for everyone else to do that. This, this is why, this is why, this is why you have to you have to take your car in for so you fail to get your alignment, you put extra pressure on the tires to do their job. And before you know it, 
the, the tires are burning out faster than what they were supposed to. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can I suggest that it's some Christians burning out faster? Because simply we're out of alignment. The second thing, possibly, everybody say assignment. Assignment. God has given everyone an assignment. An assignment is a mission or position to which a person is assigned. We each have a position in the body of Christ and a distinct mission to fulfill it. But first, you must discover your assignment. Look inside yourself. What do you know God has said to you? What is your passion? What makes you happy? What makes you angry? What excites you? The answer to these questions will help you know the assignment God has placed within you. Can I tell you, beloved, that everyone can't do your job? Can I tell you, Union Springs, everybody can't do E.L. Jacobs' job? I knew it was going to get quiet right there. I expected that one. And check this out, E.L. Jacobs can't do your job. A lot of folks are driving themselves crazy, all up in other people's business, trying to do other people's jobs. It's, no, it's, it's nothing I stand worse than a coworker that's always in my face telling me how to do my job. The baby, get back and you do your job and I the church, we got to learn our assignments and our roles, and we got to learn to do just that. If your chicken is bleeding, you don't got no business on the kitchen committee. If, if, if you got a little attitude in the morning, you don't need to be on the usher ministry. You don't need to be the first thing out people see. Can I submit to you that my brothers and sisters, that no matter what your assignment is, it's just as important as the next person's? I would dare say to you that it's just as important as the person holding the mop that is, the holding the mic. Say amen, amen, amen. Romans 12 and 4 said, just as our bodies have many parts, and each part have a special function. Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and finish here. First thing the key to success is technique. Technique. Technique is normally how you choose to handle things. Using in sports, it's beneficial because it promotes high performance and reduces the risk of injury. Yeah. Watch this. A study has shown that about 50% of people who leave the church were forced out by other people. Yeah. 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 I want to suggest to you, my brothers and sisters, that you use the wrong technique. Yeah. Possible that we have been using the church as a courtroom instead of a hospital. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps we are guilty of condemning instead of counseling. Yeah. Reverend Marshall, I might not look like it, but three or four times a week I try to work out. See, 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 see. See, I like to go to Planet Fitness, real Marsh. I like to go to Planet Fitness. And it is nothing just absolutely amazing about Planet Fitness. But there is one thing that captured my attention about Planet Fitness. And Planet Fitness establishes itself as the judgment-free zone. Uh-huh. See, their motto is, we create an environment where you can relax, go at your own pace, do your own thing without ever having to worry about being judged. I feel preaching now. Can I, can I ask y'all this question this morning? 
church adopted this motto. Uh, what, what, what if we changed our technique and how we handle people? Yeah, I ain't gonna like this, baby. Go get my truck. We're gonna have to go. What if we stopped teaching rituals and started teaching relationships? Baby, pull the car around. We got, we're going to go. We're going to go. What? Huh? The last key to success is execution. I gave you alignment, assignment, technique. Last one is execution. My brothers and sisters who are living in the day where the church can no longer afford to just show up and make plans. It does us no good to have good strategies and plans and ideas and continue to sit on them day after day. It's time we actually execute the plan. Alignment, assignment, technique, and execution. These are the ingredients necessary for a winter season. These are not the exciting aspects of the game. They are not showcased on a cool, crisp Sunday afternoon in the fall. But these are the elements that are vital to a well-played game. And this is a powerful message for us as believers. Our success of how we Christian life. Vince Lombardi brought the Packers a new philosophy that led to incredible success in the following years, uh -huh. including several league championships and Super Bowl victories. Uh -huh. A seemingly hopeless team was given a new beginning, and Lombardi became one of the most successful coaches in NFL history. Uh -huh. I would stand in the pulpit this morning and tell you that he caused a revival in Green Bay. Yeah. I'm coming. Our world, this nation, our community is in need of revival. We need God to show his presence like never before. Everything seems to be upside down and just making it through the day is getting harder and harder. My wife loves to correct my grandma. I know that's not good grammar, but that's good preaching, baby. Sin has contaminated our world. Yes, sin has flooded our community. Yes, My brothers and sisters, all you got to do is turn on the news at night or stroll up and down your, your Facebook page or your Twitter page and you'll find that our world is in a wreck yes. and everything is upside down. Yes. It wouldn't take you long to find out that all, there are men that are in love with other men and there are women lying with other other women and drugs are being sold at an all-time high yeah. and they're so bold now they, they are doing it on Facebook live yes, oh, our communities are at constant war with each other seems like there is no peace anywhere gun violence is filling the land I tell you that our world has been covered with sin and we are in desperate need of revival. Holland, how do you know that we need revival? Good, I'm glad you asked. The need for revival is simply a result of sin in our lives. Right? Revival is restoration of spiritual life of God's people and a return to the abundant life God intended for his followers. When God revives us, we can expect authentic change and real spiritual power. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their working ways, and then will I hear from heaven. And I'll forgive their sins and I will heal their land. The key to our turnaround is the same as it was for the Green Bay Packers. 
we got to get back to the basics. However, going back to the basics means a lot more than just, just, just showing up on Sunday mornings. It's more than just being able to quote a few uh, a Bible verses. Going back to the basics means allowing God's word to become such a part of us that we can stand up and be a shining light in a dark world. See, 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 many Christians are seeking the glamour and excitement and certain bizarre and flashy spiritual gifts. We're wanting a, a, a continual spiritual high. This is why you, you see all these churches and they, they just shouting, they running and they speaking in tongues, but nobody's teaching them how to live when that tongue is done. That's why they be shouting on Sunday and cussing you out on Monday. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Y'all ain't gonna say nothing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The Christian life contains basics, which may be seen as equal to uh, the four keys to success that I gave you, which were alignment, assignment, technique, and execution. These spiritual basics are not showy but they are mandatory for growing. The early church was a great example of this. They were known as uneducated and untrained men, yet they had a mighty impact. I hope you didn't close your Bibles. I don't have anything else to preach. But, But verse 42 says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the teaching. Thank you, God. The verses we have read offer insight into the makeup of the early. It was a very exciting time for us or those within the church. Amen. Satan won't have no power today. Say, won't have no power today. Amen. 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 Uh, One thing about the people of God is they showed up looking to be taught by the apostles. They showed up wanting, wanting to hear what God's word had to say. And a lot of times, this is what's wrong with the churches. We don't want to hear what, what, what's, what's real and what's authentic. We want to hear these feel-good prosperity messages. And this is why we can't last when the storm comes. We, 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 we want to come to church and just hear, feel good. You get in the car and, and you, get in, you get in a new house and this. And, and when we leave out of church, storms knock our house down. Because we're not ready and prepared for what's coming. You got to be grounded in the word. The second thing in the text I see that says is they were devoted to fellowship. They were devoted to fellowship. One thing that the church has to learn to do is we got to learn to love one another. People don't want to come to your church because you always talking about it. We got to learn to love one another. We got to learn to pick each other up. The last thing it says is they were devoted to prayer. I like the old church because they used to say prayer changes things. Uh huh. Prayer changes. Prayer changes things. Prayer will get you out of some situations that you got yourself in. But prayer will get you out of them. Prayer will protect you when you're riding up and down the dangerous highways and byways. Prayer will keep you. If we ever want to get back to a place as a church, we have to get back to these basic things. We got to learn to pray. 
in and out of season. We got to learn to love one another, to fellowship with one another. We got to learn to just thank God and love one another with no judgment and just lift each other up. And the last is we got to have sound doctrine. Can I, can I just say this? If, if you always go to church and you leave feeling good, you need a new church. You shouldn't always leave feeling good. The, the Holy Spirit don't just make you shout and speak in tongues. The Holy Spirit will convict. The Holy Spirit will tell you you're wrong. Every now and then you ought to leave church with an ouch. You stepped on me. Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Back to the basics. Amen. Come on, we can give the Lord some more praise for a sermon like that. Lord have mercy. We can give him a little bit more for some word like that. Yeah. Amen, amen, amen. I'm putting my mic down and clap my hand. Y'all ain't doing it right. <laughs> my God, my God. And if you didn't notice, his T-shirt says religion, not, re I mean, relationship, not religion. Amen, amen. The brother said he wasn't wearing no suits. I said, I ain't been wearing no suits either. He said he was wearing Christian-themed T-shirts. I said, I'm bringing mine too. Amen. But this brother preach. Amen. Amen. My spirit is filled this morning. Back to the basics. I heard a lot of amens, but I sure heard a whole lot of power. Amen. I believe I'd have heard power if it wasn't no amen. Amen. I told you he had a coach anointing. And I believe he is and will be a wonderful winning coach. But he's an even better preacher. Amen. Amen. Even went over to Romans 12 and dealt with the many members of one body. He don't know our theme is second, first, first Corinthians 12 and 12 many members one body. But they're talking about the same thing. Everybody has a valuable and key part to play in the church. We can't run over each other trying to do each other's job. We got to be in alignment. Stay in our lane. We got to stay on our assignment. My goodness. Then we got to have the right technique. He hit me with that one. Ain't it true that many of us use the church as a courtroom instead of a hospital? How many people come into the church doors hurt and broken and leave out worse than they came in? because our technique is wrong. From the pulpit to the back door, our technique has been wrong. And then he told us we gotta execute, we gotta do what we've been called to do. And I love that verse. We gotta get back to the basics. Every time I think about the direction of the church and what the church must look like, I always go back to Acts chapter two and 42. And that scripture will show you exactly what the church still needs to be doing today. Loving on each other, hearing the word and feasting on the word, receiving the word, regardless of whether it steps on our toes or not, and praying. Many of us in trouble because we don't pray. People looking for pastors and ain't praying. We just throw the first person that entertains us in the pulpit. And the hurt is a trickle down effect. Might be somebody who doesn't know the Lord this morning. And the free pardon of your sins. I want you to know that Jesus died for you.
especially you. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you've done. We read in Sunday school this morning from Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou wilt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Back then, the problem was people believing in Jesus himself because they were so traditional with the law. Today, we have the same problem except we want to believe in our technique instead of what Jesus did. You can be saved today. Maybe listening now, maybe listening later through social media. You can be saved. Maybe someone who feels that they're tired of this journey. We want to pray with you, pray for you. Maybe someone who needs special prayer. If you need special prayer, I just ask that you wave your hand. Amen. 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 Every day. I want to keep Minister Holland and his wife lifted up in our prayers. As I will tell you that being in the ministry, the devil hates your guts. And he will try you at home first. Home is the proving ground. It's the training ground. We want to cover your home with prayer. And you cover your home with prayer and with the word of God. Because preaching like that in the face of a generation of false preachers, Lord have mercy. It's hard to stand on the truth when so many people are lying. But you keep standing. Let us pray. Most holy and righteous God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. Father God, even though, as Mr. Holland said, that basics might not be good for the showing part, but they're necessary for growing. Father, it might not make us look flashy, but we'll be right. Help us as a people to go back to the basics. Help us to realize that change doesn't have to come to the church because you're the same God. Amen. Father, if we just stand on your word, we will continue to see you do mighty things among your people. Let your people know that you don't need help. And we definitely can't help you be God. But if we fall in line with what you've already spoken, Father, we'll see miracles. We'll see breakthrough. We'll see blessing. We'll see everything the false prophets are prophesying just by being in line with your word. Help us to go back to the basics. Father, we ask, Lord, that you would cover the Holland household with your blood, with a hedge of protection. I pray that you will strengthen their marriage. I pray that you will use them, Father God, as a mighty beacon of light not just in their home, but in the world. I even pray for their careers, Father God. That Lord, because of the success of their careers, that people will come to know you, Father God. In the name of Jesus, let your anointing flow through them, Father God. Then, Lord God, I pray for those who are lost, Father, who need you. I pray, Father, that you will draw them close through your word today that father they'll surrender all today and trust in Jesus father God we pray for those who have lifted their hands this morning father you know exactly what they need and I pray father that you will supply all of their needs and not just supply what they need but that you will do exceeding and abundantly above all that they ask or think according to the power that worketh in them Help, heal them, console them, comfort them, whatever they need, Father. It's all in you. Now, Father God, again, we thank you for what's been done in this place today. And it is our prayer that you have been glorified in all that we have done. 
this in the name of Jesus, we do thank you and we do pray. Let every heart say amen.